you're tuned in to the Restaurant Rockstars podcast. Powerful ideas to rock your restaurant. Here's your host, Roger Bodwin. Welcome back, guys, and thanks for listening, as always. Now, this week's episode is a biggie. The Cheesecake Factory is one of my all-time favorite restaurants, and it's certainly one of my kids' favorites, too. And we've been to many of their locations, Florida, Boston, Idaho, all over, and they're growing really, really fast. Well, in today's episode, I'm speaking with Donald Moore, who is the chief culinary officer for the Cheesecake Factory. And we're going to learn all about the ins and outs of the cheesecake, but it's so much more than that. How they prepare such an extensive menu from scratch. You know, if you've ever been to a Cheesecake Factory, the menu is literally 20 pages long. I mean, there's so much. There's something for everyone there. And I've always been amazed that in a large restaurant, how you can prep that much, how you can prepare and keep ticket times reasonable, keep your customers coming back for more. We're going to talk about their marketing and how they stay ahead of shifting consumer tastes and R&D and research and training. Staff training is a huge one. I learned from Donald all about how it trickles down from the top and how leadership plays such a huge part in the company. So stay tuned. You're not going to want to miss this episode. Again, it's a biggie. Listen on. Fellow operators and managers, forget the old way of doing business. It's time to automate your back of house. To reduce food costs, optimize labor, increase efficiencies, and grow sales and profits, you need a system. The one simple system that does it all is called Restaurant 365. Restaurant 365 is a cloud-based, restaurant-specific, all-in-one accounting and back office platform that seamlessly integrates your POS, payroll provider, and all your vendors. Use it to generate accurate, user-friendly, real-time reports to make immediate data-driven decisions. Restaurant 365 eliminates manual, error-prone processes and is designed to grow with your business. Restaurant 365 handles inventory management and helps reduce food cost. It streamlines the payables management process and automates bank reconciliations, while the scheduling feature engages employees and helps reduce labor costs. To run a stronger, more efficient restaurant, take a closer look at Restaurant 365. Check it out at www.restaurant365.com forward slash rockstar. Guys, it's no secret that labor is a huge challenge right now. But putting help wanted signs in the window is not the way to find great people, especially if you're looking to fill positions in multiple locations. Instead, the answer is Fountain. Fountain is the all-in-one talent platform, especially built for teams hiring at scale. See why over 5,000 businesses, including Burger King, KFC, Taco Bell, and more, are using Fountain to find, hire, and onboard new employees today. With Fountain, you can find more quality experienced candidates faster. You can shorten the time to hire and the employee onboarding process. You can track cost per hire and time per hire. Get automated SMS communication and automated document collection. Head on over to www.fountain.com forward slash rockstars and receive a demo plus free personal onboarding, a $500 value just for becoming a new Fountain customer. Check it out. Now, on with the episode. Welcome back, everyone, to the Restaurant Rockstars podcast. These are engaging topics that help restaurants build their brands, rock their profits, and deliver amazing guest service experiences. Wow, what a guest I have today. I'm super excited. I have Mr. Donald Moore, and he is the Executive Vice President and Chief Culinary Officer of the Cheesecake Factory with 203 locations, which is extraordinary by any means. And I know that the Cheesecake Factory needs no introduction. It's certainly one of my favorite restaurants. Welcome to the show, Donald. I'm so happy to have you here. Thank you for having me. It's an honor to be able to chat with you for a little bit. Thank you. Well, it's an honor for me. You know, I did mention that Cheesecake Factory is one of my favorites. And, you know, we're going to get into the ins and outs of, you know, what the concept is all about and how it really shines. But several things really stand out to me. But one, you know, the marketing appeal and the brand building has been stupendous. And I've got to say that one of the first things that captures anyone's imagination is you walk into a cheesecake factory location and there's literally, you know, a hundred varieties of cheesecakes in these beautiful display cases that you can't help but just mouthwater over while you're waiting for a table. 
And how you select is beyond me because you look at one after another after another and it really amazes me how your staff can prepare such an extensive menu and all those cheesecakes and have such a high volume uh, restaurant. So I'm sure we're going to get into all of that. If you wouldn't mind, Donald, if you could just tell us, I always ask my guests, how did you get into the hospitality business? What were your early influences? Was it a high school job? Was it cooking at home? Was it someone who'd been in the business who sort of, you know, mentored you? What's your story? And I know it's a, it's a great one. Sure. So uh, thank you. Um, well, I grew up in the restaurant business. I was a soccer player and I grew up on the Eastern shore of Maryland, actually. And uh, my mother always worked two jobs. So when I wasn't playing sports or was in school, I was always hanging out uh, with my mom in restaurants. And, uh, and I grew up a house with three sisters and we were always sort of taking care of everybody. And food was an integral part of our life, whether you were coming to our house and we'd open the door and offer you something to drink or make something delicious. Or if I wanted to buy soccer cleats, my mom said, you have to get a job uh, to pay for those cleats. And uh, so I learned very good values and hard work and had some unbelievable uh, mentors along the way um, of hospitality. I worked at this great seafood restaurant at 13 years old on the Eastern Shore of Maryland called the Crab Claw. And, and from that moment, whether it was I was a busboy, a cook, a dishwasher, or interacting with the guests, I had unbelievable role models that made me understand that it was all about the guests and the way they felt and to make sure that we were serving them and to go out of the way to hold a door, to dive on the floor for a napkin, make sure the crabs were steaming hot, to anticipate the needs of a guest. So that was drilled in my life uh, at a very early age. And I'd also add that I grew up playing sports. I thought I was going to be a professional soccer player and went to college to play soccer. And um, the restaurant business is a lot like sports. You go to work every day with a goal to be excellent and you have to do it with the players around you and, uh, and love failure and hard work. And, uh, and you have to get up every day and try to get a little bit better and put one foot in front of the other and make improvements. So those were two really good parallel paths for me of a mother that instilled hard work and a servant sort of lifestyle and sports background of learning how to work in a team and, and reach your excellence every day. I totally get that. And, and what one word comes to mind that is just jumping out crystal clear. And that one word is hospitality. And that really is the driving, you know, um, influence of this business. It's all about hospitality and pleasing the guests and treating every customer as if the most important customer. And I certainly, you know, I, I've visited many different cheesecake factory restaurants uh, across the country in my travels. I've been to one uh, down in Palm Beach, Florida, and I've been to one in Boston, and I've been to one in Boise, Idaho. I mean, I've been to quite a few, and it's also one of my kids' favorite restaurants. And I've got to say that I've had consistent, memorable experiences at, at all of them, and that is a cornerstone of the brand. So I think that's tremendous that your team, and you mentioned the word teamwork, the importance of teamwork, at such a large level, you've got 203 locations, yet the consistency is there. And I'm not just speaking for myself. I know this is, you know, what you strive for. So I want to get into training in a few minutes and, and how all that gets achieved. But, sure. you know, I know that you've also worked at Planet Hollywood. That was part of your career a while back. And then you transitioned, you know, as a kitchen manager in a cheesecake factory location. Do you want to sort of bring us up to date on those experiences and how it led to your current position? Sure. So when I, uh, when I, was out of college, I went to work for Planet Hollywood as an executive chef at a very early age. And I got to work directly with Robert Earl, who was the founder in New York City, and spend a lot of time with Robert. And he had unbelievable standards, was a lot of fun, worked very hard, and really looked at the business as a whole, just like we do at Cheesecake Factory, really the total experience, what the guests has experienced, what the staff has experienced. Um, and to make sure that the business, and I, I learned a lot of exceptional lessons from him. Um, and then I joined Cheesecake Factory, uh, got recruited by them, and um, started in New York as a kitchen manager. Like a lot of executives in our company, we have unbelievable tenure um, and retention. I can, I can dive deeper into that uh, in the podcast. But I started as a kitchen manager and became, uh, we don't hire chefs or executive kitchen managers from the outside. Everybody sort of starts at an entry level, and then you go through this training program that's very uh, intense and focused and very detailed. 
to learn the food, the culture, the systems, the finance, the operations. Because we really want our managers and our restaurants not only to be great cooks, but great business people and great managers. And those three pillars are very, very important to our front of the house and kitchen managers. And that's why I think we've had a lot of success for four decades. Um, so I was in my role. I got promoted to be an executive kitchen manager in about a year. And then an area kitchen operations manager, which we have in our company, which are responsible for about eight to 10 restaurants. And I got moved out to San Francisco and had San Francisco, uh, Seattle, and Hawaii as my region. And then about a year and a half after that, I got promoted to director of kitchen operations and then vice president of kitchen operations and then chief culinary officer, executive vice president of kitchen operations, which I've been in that role for about 10 years now. And, uh, and I've, I've worked very hard on um, this business is very hard. But I think the thing that I would say about our company is um, I found a home that was perfect for me. There's just unbelievable pride, unbelievable passion, the quality of people here, the, the founder of this company and his standards of excellence and his standards of taking care of his staff members and management. Um, and, you'll, and the tenure around this company is just I, it's, I can walk around our corporate office where and today, and our corporate chef's been here for 30 years. Uh, Kix Nystrom, our vice president, next to me has been here for 27 years. And I could keep going, 18 years, 25 years. And not only at the management level, but even at the hourly level. I was in two of our restaurants yesterday um, in the Grove in Los Angeles and Santa Monica um, doing some stuff and just talking to cooks in those restaurants that have been there for 20 years. A prep cook, 21 years. Amazing. Uh, Salté cook, 22 years. So there's this yeah. exceptional... Yeah, uh, retention in our company because we really respect our staff members. You know, I I definitely like to um, dive into that. But before we do, can you give us a brief history of of the Cheesecake Factory, when it was founded, where it was founded, and maybe the growth pattern since then, and sure. you know, some of the so accomplishments I, along the uh, decades. Sure. So the three wonderful founders, Oscar and Evelyn Overton, and our current uh, CEO chairman of the board and founder, uh, David Overton, who uh, still runs a company, an unbelievable mentor and leader for all of us, and uh, Standard Bear. They started with the mom found a, a cheesecake recipe in a newspaper in Detroit and uh, started baking cheesecakes and had great response to them. And then eventually David came out to college in San Francisco and the parents came west as well and ended up in Los Angeles and started to uh, bake the cheesecakes and sell them to restaurants uh, in a little place in the valley. And there was so much demand for them. And they finally said, let's open up a, a shop on, uh, on in Beverly Hills on, uh, on our original location in 1978. It's a wonderful story of really parents and a son coming together and having this vision to showcase, uh, really, David, to showcase his mom's cheesecake. So they opened up a uh, restaurant in Beverly Hills, put a little card in the window, and David tells this story often, uh, that we'll be open at two o'clock because they didn't know how to handle the lunch rush. And he looked up and then at two o'clock, there was a line wrapped around the block. And uh, from that day on, fast forward to almost over 40 years later, we're feeding 100 million people a year right now, which was never a goal of the company. It was just to get up every day and serve delicious food, give unbelievable hospitality, care about your staff, care about your guests. And, uh, and look at the progression. He still tells stories to this day of loving going out in 1978 and sweeping uh, the sidewalk in front of the restaurant and talking to all the local merchants and, and all the hard work that went into creating something. And, and I originally looked at the, uh, or recently looked at the uh, original menu and it was one page uh, with a few items because the focus was really on the cheesecake. And now fast forward 40 years later and we have over 250 menu items still made from scratch. We make everything in our restaurants, make every over 150 dressings and sauces, roll every avocado egg roll, uh, just to make our famous macaroni and cheese balls is about a day's worth of effort. And that's very important to us that our guests get something that's very compelling and worth coming for. Okay, so that begs the question, how do you keep all that standardized in 203 locations? I mean, it's all about systems, of course, but everything, I mean, you've got so many different employees and people have different ways of doing things and the portion sizes have to be the same and the flavor profiles have to be the same and the consistency of everything. I mean, I don't need to tell you this, but it's like, how do you achieve that in so many locations and what's the quality control secret? 
Sure. So I think there was a really wonderful article that references what we do a few years ago in the New Yorker by a doctor named Atul Gawande. He wrote a book uh, called The Checklist Manifesto. And he wrote this great article about the healthcare system and how the healthcare system should study the Cheesecake Factory and then and our consistency. It was a great complement to mainly our people, our process and our systems and our training, which we spend an exhaustive amount of effort, time and money on. Um, but when you look at how we're able to sort of deal with buying 700 food ingredients and having 250 menu items, the, the single biggest reason we're able to do that is our people. We've been on Fortune's top 100 companies to work for for six years in a row. I think we were number 25 or 29 last year. We're the only restaurant company on there because, um, you know, if you could reference the, the great leadership management um, of Peter Drucker, he always said that culture always trumps strategy. We hire the best and brightest people. We retain our management. We retain our staff, which is very, very important to us. Um, we have systems. We focus on culinary excellence, you know, food safety, quality. Um, we want to make sure our staff is engaged, that they're inspired. They feel they have great purpose. They can feel the success of the restaurant. And we really focus on the culinary equation for us, which is buying the freshest, high-quality ingredients showing those ingredients the greatest technique to make sure that food is delicious and memorable. And memorable meaning, you know, you eat something, you're eating a burger and it's getting smaller and you look at it and you go, well, it's, get, you know, it's about to end and you're starting to get sad. That's how we want you to think when you eat our food. And we continue to innovate. We spend a lot of time on technology, really good math to make sure we're prepping the right amount of food and we're very focused on waste as a company. Um, and that's sort of our secret. And um, and we train a lot, but we have unbelievable management in the restaurant. Our average tenure of our executive kitchen managers is 13 years, which is equivalent for our executive chef. So you can imagine having 203 restaurants and having such confidence that you have an average tenure of 13 years. And we very rarely lose that position. And the general manager in our company is so critical. I mean, they're really in charge of the whole operation and their standards and their ability to work in the kitchen in the front of the house is super critical to how we manage our business. Absolutely. So it's a testament to leadership from above. It's also, I'm sure you pay very well because you're attracting the best and the brightest people with the, with the greatest experience levels and then the training. And there's got to be recognition and rewards also, I'm sure, right? People get recognized for their achievements. Absolutely. We have um, we have a program for our hourly cooks called the Code of the Master Culinary. And if they um, sort of demonstrate and get tested and assessed on these 10 traits of a culinarian, whether it's knife skills or working clean or sense of urgency or the depth of knowledge of the restaurant, they get recognized with different uniforms and a lot of praise in the restaurants. We have an unbelievable program called the Commitment to Excellence Program. Uh, where the restaurants all over the country nominate their best staff members from each work group, a work group being a cook or a server or a baker. And, um, and then the executive team votes on these nominations, and then we fly them to our general manager's conference in Las Vegas, and they're recognized in the Mandarin Oriental in an almost black tie dinner. And it's a really beautiful night. Um, yeah. people, people from all different backgrounds from all over the world that – their general manager gets up and does a you know 20 minute speech on what they mean to the business and the impact they've had on that restaurant and not only just on the restaurant but the people that they work with peer to peer and how they're in leaders and 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 it's a really beautiful thing to recognize so i could go on all day about uh, the amazing things we do to recognize our staff but uh, it's a it's it's really them that are the talk, they're touching the guests that we do. Well, I'm really getting passion from you, and this passion runs deep in our business, as you know, but you clearly are a leader in, in a high position in a very iconic American company, but that passion seems to be passed down right down to the line as well and every level of the business. So this is incredible. I mean, I, I have to use that word iconic because 
very, this is an incredibly competitive business. I don't need to tell any of our listeners that or yourself, but just to, you know, the competitive advantages that I'm hearing you talk about are, are good takeaway lessons for any independent operator, whether they have one location or a few multiple locations or they're a small chain. I mean, these are the driving philosophies that make a company successful. And it really starts with the people and how we train them and how we treat them and recognize and reward them because ultimately it impacts the guest experience. And, you know, we cannot afford, especially in this age of, of social media and online reviews, not to treat every guest like the most important guest. So thank you for the lessons you're sharing. My Let me ask you something. Here's sort of an out of left field question. We talked about walking into a cheesecake factory and seeing all those variety of cheesecakes. So how many people have room for the cheesecake after they're eating, you know, really elaborate meals because the menu is quite extensive. We're going to get into that. But is can you say that, you know, there's more of a takeout cheesecake business now where people will take a piece or several pieces or even buy a whole cheesecake to cake home after they finish their meal or a lot of people eating the cheesecakes in the stores or are some people coming in just for cheesecake? I would say all of the all of the above, all the above. And, then, and then some. I mean, yeah. we have, uh, you know, look, it's the Cheesecake Factory. It's the first thing you see when you walk in yep. to the restaurant. And that is very intentional. There is not a, I would say, centimeter of that restaurant that our founder has not thought about the way the guest is experiencing. He sits down at every table and looks at every angle. He looks at every light bulb. He checks every little detail because he wants our guests to be to feel upscale. The tables are heavy. The bread and water come right when you sit down as you've been waiting for an hour and a half. Every detail has been thought of. And the cheesecakes are such a critical part. I mean, we have some of the highest dessert sales, if not the highest dessert sales of any restaurant company in the world. And it's because Ed, the cheesecakes are absolutely delicious. I mean, they are everything food should be. They're decadent. No they're they're special. Every texture, every layer is thought about and combed over by our founder. We have an unbelievable vice president in our bakery named Chris Radovan, who does such a good job partnering with David and the team to create these cheesecakes. And um, and so there, you know, the guests, everybody really eats them inside our restaurant. They take them home. They go and come in for dinner. Then they go to a movie and they come back in for a slice of cheesecake and an espresso. You, you should see some of our international guests. I, I fly to our restaurants um, all over the world. I'm actually going to Macau this weekend to open up a restaurant. And uh, and you'll get on the airplanes and you'll see big cheesecake bags of people taking cheesecakes back to their country. It's just such an iconic thing. And we've always wanted to be an iconic global brand. It's, it's interesting you bring that word in. It's been a big goal of David, our founders. And, and the cheesecake is such a critical part of that. Do they change um, from time to time? Do you bring in new cheesecake varieties and some of the old go away or do you just constantly add to that menu? Like how does, what happens yep. there? For sure. The cheesecakes are, um, you know, there's usually one or two new cheesecakes a year, depending on what we're doing. Um, mm -hmm. Every year we have National Cheesecake Day, which is one of the craziest days in our restaurants. Uh, the managers have to like suit up like soldiers going to war to be able yeah. to make sure that every guest gets what they need. And uh, we just recently launched a pineapple upside down cheesecake. And that's been a good partnership over the years and it changes. But we've, you know, that whatever the cheesecake of the it is for that day. A lot of that money, a uh, percentage of that money is given back to our food banks around the country that we support too, because we're very big on supporting our local communities. Um, and so the cheesecakes, that National Cheesecake Day is a special day for us. And there could be some other ones as we change our menu, because we change our menu twice a year. Uh, in all of our restaurants. Yeah, that sounds like a marketing coup to me. Did Cheesecake Factory have anything to do with creating National Cheesecake Day? I'm not sure. I, I've heard we've talked about that internally, yeah. but, uh, but I think we've had a big part of making it bigger for sure. Oh, that's fantastic. Okay, let's talk about the menu now. Again, we have such an extensive menu and it's like page after page after page and there's clearly something for everyone. So how can the kitchen and staff prepare such an extensive menu with reasonable ticket times made from scratch, you know, in a large restaurant that has so many seats, like what's the magic formula for that? Well, I think the magic formula is we train extensively. So when we change a menu, which is twice a year, we add 10 or 15 things and we take off 10 or 15 things, depending on what America or the world wants to eat. And we bring all of our area chefs or area kitchen operations managers, we call them, 
and our area directors of operations to our headquarters in Calabasas, and they go through a very, very thorough training process. Uh, not just sent materials, but they're here, they cook the food, they make the sauces, they learn every detail of food, and they go through it, and then they have to teach it back as well. And then they go and train their general managers and executive kitchen managers on that in their areas, whether they're in South Florida or Boston or um, any of the restaurants you visited, that process happens. And then that management team then trains our hourly staff. Um, and they, we, that is very thorough, a lot of time, a lot of energy, and a lot of investment to make sure that once we've created uh, something we just put on uh, was a brick chicken, that every component, every nuance of that dish, the way we want the, how crispy we want the skin to be, to the texture of the potatoes that we bake and then tear and then fry, to the right cook on the shishito peppers, all of that detail gets to the hourly staff member because it's most important that the person doing the work has the most knowledge, uh, not the people managing it. So we, uh, we really focus on that the staff member gets the best level of training. Uh, everybody gets trained, but really need to make sure that cook does. So that, uh, that's it. And then we have in every restaurant, we have a, a very large management team that is focused on guest experience, um, whether it's holding the door for somebody when they come in or that the mashed potatoes taste like they were just made or the bread just has just come out of the oven. Um, there's a certain standard of excellence that we're looking for that delicious memorable food. Um, and there's a lot of systems, processes, training, um, and really waking up every day and going to work. Uh, and when those doors open at 11 or 1130 in the morning, and that first guest enters the building, that they're there to serve that guest, whatever need they may be. And that's very, very critical that you have that mindset every day and that care for the guests, no matter what the challenges are, which are, are a lot. Our restaurant managers go through a lot every day. There's a lot of components they have to, to manage, but that the service and the food are perfect once those guests come in the door right when we open. Can you speak to um, perhaps an onboarding of a new front of house person and a back of house person? Do they shadow veterans that have been there a while for so many shifts before they literally get their feet wet in the position? Um, is it, do you send them to school? Like there's a cheesecake factory university or something along those lines. So what is the typical training procedure and how do you onboard people? Sure. So a very selective hiring process. So when you make it into one of our restaurants, you should be really proud because we have a very detailed and thorough hiring process and we're only looking for the best people. And then when they get trained, there's a very sort of detailed program of what you do every day. What, you know, if you're a cook, from eight to nine o'clock, you're gonna watch videos on our culture. From nine to 10, you're gonna learn um, how to cut. And we, we want people to come in that get trained that come from, you might have a lot of experience, but under, using your experience to help you be successful, but then learning the way we do things as well, which we're very particular, the way we cook a carrot or cut herbs or make lemon butter sauce. Um, and they'll shadow uh, a designated trainer, whether it's in the front, or the kitchen, um, and so each day is very scripted down to the minute, and then there it could be 10 days, could be 14 days for an hourly staff member um, to go through that training, and, you know, and they'll get the expertise of somebody that's been doing the job for a while, and then when they're ready, they'll be turned loose uh, to do it by themselves, and then at the management level, it's months uh, to learn all the things that we do, because there's so much complexity uh, in our business, you know, when the world's best chefs have come into our restaurants and I've given them a tour, they look at us and they go, you're just crazy. Why would you ever attempt uh, doing something like this? And, and to David, our founder, it's very strategic. Uh, he always says that everybody says we do everything wrong. Uh, you know, the menu's too big, the portions are too big, uh, there's too much complexity, and that's exactly why we've been so successful. So to be able to do that selection, training, and ultimately, the silver bullet is keeping your best people. And because we, when you, know, when you have a cook that's having a bad day, you really have to manage the gray. Maybe they've been with you for 15 years and they have one off shift and mm -hmm. they have something going on at home. You need to run out and be sitting in their trunk when they want to quit and say, let's talk about this. Let's help you. Because it's more than just a restaurant. It's about life. And it's about supporting people, not just in our restaurants to grow, but at home too. Um, and that's really ingrained in our culture is to really look at the whole person and make sure that people are succeeding professionally and personally. And, um, and I've learned so much myself 
person in a restaurant. So the training is very, very diligent. We do have something that's really cool. It's actually happened this week. And we do it a few times a year called Cheesecake Factory Institute, where if you're a manager and you've graduated training, you've been working for a few months in the restaurant, you'll come out to California and you'll go through a few days of uh, additional training and the inspiration from all the leaders of the company and experts and people that are doing your current role. Um, and that's how we continue to keep our managers on top and fresh and focused and hopefully inspired. Yeah, inspiration is, is a huge word here, but I'm also feeling empowerment comes to play. You know, you give people a great deal of responsibility, you lead by example, you train extensively, and then you kind of get out of their way and, and let them use their good judgment and their mission statement about what Cheesecake Factory is all about to really move the business forward on an individual level. And that collective uh, is very, very powerful, I'm, I'm sensing. Yeah, for sure. And I just I could add to that, that uh -huh. to everything. I mean, look, you, there's a certain, the three founders, parents and sons said, this is what we want our company to be. We'll learn over time. We'll get better. We'll have smart people coming out. But once the restaurant opens up in Palm Beach or Bar Baltimore or, or Dubai Mall, um, it's up to those managers to execute that mission every day. And our mission is values and take care of the staff and, 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 if you're going to do something, you should do it with excellence. And then if the, something's not working, we want our management and staff to speak up and tell us it's not working. We're very open to the feedback because the, we just want to make the business better for our shareholders, for our guests, for our staff, um, so that we change a lot to continue to refine and improve things. So let's talk about R&D. Um, obviously, shifting consumer tastes and all that sort of thing. But it would be really easy to say your business is strong and that, you know, same store sales are growing and people really love the concept. And there's that balance you have to reach between don't fix what isn't broken, but staying ahead of the curve and anticipating the next future trends and all that. It's like, what do you do there? Sure. Um, I think that we take R and D very serious. Uh, that is our CEO and founders, um, you know, one of the his most interested things about the business and, and really he's been brilliant at creating things that people want to eat. And uh, I mean, he's done it for four decades. I've learned so much and I'm so grateful to be able to work so closely with, uh, you know, really an industry icon. And I think we look at our food from a research and development standpoint in really three ways. Um, if it's something that everybody else has on their menu, like uh, spaghetti and meatballs, or an old fashioned burger, how is ours going to be better? Ours is going to be better because we're going to buy better ingredients. We're going to show those ingredients better technique, and we're going to make sure it's delicious and memorable. And delicious is, I said this before, but it's, oh, this is so good. And then hopefully a week later, you're thinking about it. And Nick, just like on an old fashioned burger, it's just a hamburger that everybody has. But we over, we patty our burgers twice a day. So they're very soft. And they're not like hockey pucks and they're not tough. And our ground beef is extremely fresh. Slice our tomatoes twice a day. We season our meat a certain way. The burger gets cooked on a certain temperature of the grill. So it gets a Maillard reaction and the crust happens and the juices stay in. The bun, we want soft but crispy on the bottom. And then that, there's about 50 things that we look at with a, an ingredient, that a burger that just has five or six things on it. And then if it's the second rail of food is if it's, something that everybody has, how do we make it more fun or interesting or compelling? So macaroni and cheese, everybody has macaroni and cheese. We decided to bread it and fry it. And to these mac and cheese balls that are one of our most popular appetizers. And it's, you know, it takes hours to make. You have to cook the pasta, grate all these fresh cheeses, make a, a white sauce and then bake it and cool it down and scoop it and make breadcrumbs and do all these things and make a right. marinara that takes hours to make. Yeah. And, um, and hopefully when you get that, you can taste it just is better and it tastes fresher and the ingredients are more high quality. And then the last rail would be food of today. So what's happening in the world? Um, we, there's no doubt there's a giant movement around plant-based proteins, vegan, vegetarian, gluten-free, health and wellness, but people remain uh, wildly interested in indulgent food too. So we have to strike the balance between all of those things. And, um, and I think that we're still, we, we have a impossible burger that's very, very popular on our menu. Uh, that's totally vegan. We, you know, we have a vegan bun, a vegan cheese. We made this special sauce that's vegan and it's becoming one of our most popular burgers. Um, so we can sort of, you know, David's always said, there's nothing that, uh, America wants to eat that can't go on our menu. 
the, the, the sort of funny part of it is um, we fall in love with every dish. Sometimes the guests don't fall in love with them. So we take things off the menu, which is heartbreaking, but we have a good laugh about it. Um, but one of the thing, the number one complaint I get in my position when I travel and see friends or go around the country or I'm sitting next to somebody in an airplane is why did you take my favorite dish off? And uh, the love of something that I just was with on an airplane flying back from Maryland last weekend. And I sat next to somebody, saw my computer and he goes, you work for the Cheesecake Factory. And he went off on me about taking off the Navajo chicken sandwich. He goes, I went to Cheesecake every week on Wednesday to have the Navajo chicken sandwich. How dare you take that off? And uh, I said, you should have bought more of them because, <laughs> uh, you know, you know, that's how we really decide to take things off the menu when they don't sell. So we get a lot of flack for uh, deleting people's favorites because every time you take something off, it's somebody's favorite. So that's a clear indicator. You run product mix reports fairly often and you see volume of sales of all these items and they have to reach a certain quota, right, in order to show you that across the chain, these things are all selling, selling well, they're all profitable, the costs are in line, that sort of thing? Yeah, I would say for sure. We look at a lot of details and I'll get into that, but I think that what goes on and off the menu is an art and a science. It's not just purely sales. It's um, We might have guests that need a certain item like Quinoa and Faro that want that, but it might not be a top seller, mm -hmm. but we'll keep that on because there's a guest that needs that item. Um, there are there could be a fish we're behind. Like we used to sell a lot of mahi mahi. The water temperature changed. It was a fresh mahi, so we the guests still wanted it, but we couldn't get the fish. Um, so we took that off the menu. So there's popular things we've taken off. There's things that we keep on that maybe are low sellers for a certain guest. Um, but in the end, the strongest items survive, and those are what stay on the menu. Remember that. Um, you know, for major restaurant companies, we we are not a company that uses focus groups. Um, to create and put things on the menu. It's really David's vision and what he wants on the menu and, the, and myself and the team, Chef Bob Kerr and our R&D chefs, and we decide what direction we go. Um, so we're paying attention to what's happening in the world. We're eat, out eating at restaurants, we're cooking recipes that our mothers maybe cooked. Um, it, you know, we always say that the inspiration for the menu could be anything from a magazine to a TV show to looking at a tree to eating at a, in some beautiful grandmother's trunk in Mexico City that's making tacos for 50 cents and you had this unbelievable taco, um, that, could, that could inspire what goes on our menu or, or at the French Laundry and everything in between. So there, we're really drawing inspiration from everywhere uh, to put on the menu. But it's a definite art and science to what shows up on our menu. Well, let me ask you a question. Internationally, do you adapt the existing menu to, you know, regional or cultural differences or tastes in different countries? Or is it literally, here's the Cheesecake Factory, American icon, here's our menu, and we have international people from all over visiting our restaurants, depending on what country it is, it doesn't matter, it's a standardized menu? Sure. So um, that's a great question. One I get asked a lot is uh, what what we found was when we, we have we have over, the, I think, almost getting close to 15 to 20 restaurants in the Middle East. We have restaurants in Shanghai, Hong Kong, Beijing, and then we have some restaurants in Mexico City, Guadalajara. What those guests want. And it's amazing. When I walk around the mall in Kuwait or in Beijing, you get stopped 100 times. There's a cheesecake factory here. We're so well known um, around the world. And a lot of it becomes, uh, especially in China, it's from the Big Bang Theory of Penny, who was the server there. And everybody in China loves that show. Uh, but we're so well known around the world. And what those guests want is Americana. They want the food exactly like it is um, in the U.S. And they've been coming to the U.S. for years on vacation and going to the Cheesecake Factory. It's always one of their top stops. Top stop. So most of our menu in, in our international restaurants is the exact same as it is in the U.S. But like one caveat is in the, in the Middle East, for example, we don't cook with pork or alcohol. And so we've tailored those recipes that are very right. popular, like that our chicken sense. Madeira, making, using classic techniques to make Madeira wine using the ingredients to make it taste like Madeira wine when we don't use the wine, but we still have the chicken Madeira there. And our R&D team has done a fantastic job with that. And those guests, you couldn't tell the difference between the one in the U.S. and the one in Dubai. Um, and it's the same exact dish, but different ingredients. So, um, and, and in, the, in the international restaurants, we might have something special, like for in Macau, for example, 
we'll have a Portuguese chicken, which is something that's very famous in that part of uh, China. And it's an influence of like Portuguese and uh, with curry spices and things like that. So there might be one special dish that we do local. But for the most part, uh, they want what we're serving in the U.S. Excellent. You're obviously very in-depthly aware of everything and the operating philosophies. And I'm not sure... Can you speak to marketing and brand building if I ask you a couple of questions there? Sure, I can I can take a crack at it. I spent okay. a lot of time with our our marketing team. Yeah, I was hoping you would and I and I got the sense that you're you're very knowledgeable about the overall direction of the company and how it how it sustains loyalty. I wanted to ask you that question, but first um do you do anything special to create trial from first-time visitors? Um look what what do you what do you at in specifically it, what do you introducing somebody new who's never been to a cheesecake factory or maybe it's uh obviously you're in a lot of major cities across the country and sure. is there any specific marketing that will attempt to influence someone's decision where they don't know where they're going to eat but they've never been to a cheesecake factory but you want to introduce them to the concept and the brand for the first no, time i i think um you know i think the thing that i would say is that um, we market way less than most major restaurant companies. Um, our marketing has always been, you know, dark to go bags. Uh, we'll see them in the mall and really just great hospitality and, and word of mouth. I mean, that's been sort of the strategy for David forever. Uh, we have, we do are doing more and more around telling our story and the beautiful story of our culture, our made from scratch story, because people just can't believe that we still make everything in our restaurants from scratch. But when the guest comes for the first time, so many of our guests are repeat guests, but when they do come for the first time, we're hoping that they walk in and they see the cheesecakes. They feel their table and it feels heavier. The bread is hot right out of the oven. We just, if we get all the components of our steps of service and the delicious meal and then, and then end with an unbelievable slice of original cheesecake, we think that that's enough to get that guest to come back. So it's very, very important that... Um, that we get those the, all the hospitality things right, and I, I don't think there's a, a big effort. We don't talk about that much about the first time guests. We have to be thinking a certain way. The servers will ask those questions when they're at the table. Have you dined with us before? And then they can help navigate through the menu. Or here are some of my favorites. Or let me tell you what about the experience. And our servers are amazing at that. They do a really good job with those guests that might be there for the first time. Okay, that's excellent. You know, I think all the locations that I've visited, whether it be, you know, Florida or Chestnut Hill, Massachusetts or Boise, they've all been in upscale shopping malls. Do you have any standalone locations or are they all pretty much mall based with the right demographic? I think it's a blend of all of it. I think that um, there's without question, um, David and our team, they want to be in the best locations anywhere in the world. And we've been very lucky because of our brand, because of how busy our restaurants are and the demand that um, we've gotten really good sites in all the best properties around there. You'll see us in if it's the best mall in any city. Mm -hmm. We're usually exactly where we want to be and where the mall wants us to be. And it's a great partnership with uh, those locations. So, um, but we do have a few standalone locations um, in maybe smaller cities. We just opened up in Gainesville, Florida, actually a week ago it's one of our busiest openings ever um and that's it's in a property but it's more standalone so uh, you know there's a good percentage connected to malls and there's a few standalones as well as we sort of go into different cities i think you might have mentioned that you you travel to many of the new locations frequently and is that to sort of get people up to speed in the standards is that a quality control thing after they've been open for a while i mean your job seems to be pretty extensive to me it's uh, we wear a lot of hats, but we love it. And, you know, this is this is uh, what we signed up for, and which is very important. to me. And I think this is another David Overton nugget hmm. is he's always said the cash registers in the restaurant. It's not at our corporate office and that it's very important. So at every opening when we open up, the, David goes, our president, David Gordon, who's been with our company, is an amazing man, our uh, been by our company over 20 years, our SVP of operations goes, our regional vice president goes. There's a whole team that goes to every new restaurant opening to make sure the design is perfect. We're engaged with that community. The standards of excellence are set. We're working with the team. Uh, everything is great from a hospitality standpoint. And we work, you know, 12, 15 hours a day. And then when we're in those areas, if, let's just say we uh, open one up in 
Coral Gables, which we're probably we're opening up later this year. Uh, we'll go visit our other uh, restaurants in the area and look at the lighting, look at the music, look at the food, look at the design and see if we can help those teams continue to make that restaurant better. Listen to the concerns and opportunities from our general managers um, who know their business so well um, and really continue to evolve. I mean, you just cannot rest and sit still. Uh, there's never been more dining options. And then um, I was recently listening to something that Danny Myers said. It's just you have to make the experience compelling. Um, and David set the standard and our executive team set the standard of we'll continue to get better. We'll continue to learn from our staff and managers and our guests. And we'll take those learnings and have action around them to continue to refine the business. Is there a target number of stores that you'd like to reach for a goal in the future? How many stores are you opening up uh, on an annual basis? Um, is there any end in sight? What's the future of the Cheesecake Factory? Well, I think the future is we want to continue to make cheesecake better. We have other brands, uh, the Grand Lux Cafe, which we have a bunch of locations. We have two Rock Sugar uh, kit, uh Rock Sugar Kitchens, too, which are, um, it's like a Southeast Asian restaurant, one in Oak Brook and one in Century City. We just opened a fast casual restaurant called Social Monk in Westlake Village, which is unbelievable Southeast Asian food, very exciting. And then recently, um, we made an acquisition of Fox Restaurant Concepts um, and their brands as well, which we're working on closing that out at the same time. And all of that information is public, but a wonderful partnership with Sam Fox and his restaurants and uh you know north italia flower child excellent brands that just guests go crazy for and we're really excited about the partnership um with them so in cheesecake i think we've always said publicly that we probably will get to around 300 locations and um you know a, a typical year could be five to six cheesecake factories i'm not in charge of those decisions you know i just whatever i'm whatever we open we want to make the food delicious but we say publicly usually this time of year how many restaurants we're going to open but for the last few years, it's been around five to 10 restaurants a year, domestic and international, and then opening some of our other concepts as well. So exciting. Wow. You mentioned Flower Child a moment ago. They were a past guest just a couple of weeks back. I interviewed their director of marketing, Anita Walker, and it was- She's, uh, she's, she's fantastic. Yeah. You know, that was, a, that was an excellent interview as well. And again, a fast growing concept with a whole unique formula. And, it, and it's interesting that you have an alignment there. Very excited. I actually walked by that flower child in Santa Monica last night at nine o'clock and it was packed, uh, right. which is people. Yeah, it would look great. Hmm. Is there anything that we'd like to discuss that uh, that I may have missed asking you? Anything else you want to share with our audience? No, I think the questions were fantastic. I think that, um, you know, we're we're a company that's over 40 years old with exceptional people and uh, and just getting started on trying to make the guest experience better hopefully make it better for our people. And there's a, just a ton of care here and a level of excellence that's set by our founder to continue to make the business better in whatever we're doing. And we'll get, we're continuing to work on smarter technology and innovate around food and things in the kitchen that we're doing to, uh, to make the business better, whether it's marketing, whether it's you know, IT, there's a lot happening in our company that's very exciting for the future. And I'm quite proud to work here and uh, be able to share the story of, uh, of a place I've been for 18 years. Let me ask you one last question. If you were to give an independent operator, owner operator, some advice on how they move from, say, one location to two to five to maybe 10 in a regional area without losing sight of what made the original one so special, what would that what would that advice be? Because there's so many moving pieces in restaurants. I call it the business of a thousand details. But how does someone expand from one to the next and not and be able to be in multiple places at once, you know, and maybe on a limited budget with a limited management team? Sure. So I think that's a, a question I think about often. And I once was listening to Thomas Keller, um, who was my favorite American chef talk about growth and obviously he can get any opportunity to grow anything he wants because he's just uh, so brilliant and uh, any of his places are just so meticulous and so great from a, from a guest experience standpoint. But he sort of talked about the fact that you need to have somebody that understands your vision um, that could go take over that restaurant. So it's, you know, you want to open another Bouchon somewhere, for example, he knows the format of what Bouchon should be but he needs somebody that understands his standards of excellence, 
the standards of the way they treat people, the culture of the Bouchon, and somebody that's been living it for a while. So I, I think that the most important thing to do to, is to be patient to make sure you've worked out all the kinks because it's a very hard business. It's a lot of effort and a lot of detail to make um, to make money in the restaurant business. And once you found a place that can do it, it's really special. But to get somebody that clearly understands your vision, that can you can trust completely, um, that can go run that restaurant without you being there because in the end, you cannot be there and you can't be in two places. And that's when I see something great that scales that falls short is they don't have a general manager, they don't have an executive chef that clearly understands what the culture's about, what the standards of service are about, what the standards of food are about. And, um, and they just think that their sort of processes and systems can supersede the leader of the restaurant. And our success and our ability to scale has been that we've always had general managers and executive kitchen managers that are ready, that understand all of those components that can take over those restaurants. And we have area directors and area kitchen operations managers over top of them that have been the average tenure of that group is 15 and 17 years, somewhere in those years. So when you can open a restaurant in Gainesville and the area director and area kitchen operations manager have been with a company for a combined 35 years, and they understand what the vision is of the founder, the systems, the product. That's how you make it work. And you have to be very patient. But I caution to those that think that if they have something on paper and they can just give it to somebody and have them do it, um, that can be very, very challenging when you have a complex business. Uh, the franchise model is different. But when you have something that's very complex, I think that presents great opportunity. Excellent advice. Thank you so much, Donald. It's been such a pleasure talking to you. And again, it was my honor because, again, one of my favorite restaurants and to have someone who's had such an illustrious career in hospitality. I've learned a lot from you. And I know this has been a great uh, contribution to the podcast and to our audience's benefit. So thanks for joining us today. Yo, thank you for the kind words. It's been my pleasure. Well, folks, that was the Restaurant Rockstars podcast. We can't wait to see you in the next episode. Thank you so much for tuning in. Guys, I don't need to tell you, this industry runs on passion. And Donald and I, our conversation was so full of the passion of what it is to create and operate and market and sustain and to build a powerful brand. This is what it's all about in restaurants, folks. I hope you enjoyed this episode as much as I enjoyed talking with Donald. I love talking shop with operators. Donald has an illustrious career, something really to be proud of, but so many key learnings in this episode. So thanks again for tuning in. But of course, it's all about systems. And we talked so much about the menu in this particular episode and how extensive their menu is. And one of the things that I specialize in, I do some personal one-on-one -on -one coaching every year, every quarter, I have a couple of slots open to work one-on-one, -on -one, you know, coaching and cl client consulting. And one of the things that I really specialize in is a menu designed for maximum profit. And so many clients that, you know, I work with, they put menus together and they don't really put it together for variety, appeal to the customer, but most importantly, profit. You know, it's all over the place. And when we dig deep and we look at their costing sheets or if they have never costed out their menu and we do the costing and then we run a product mix report and we see the volume of sales, what I find most often is their least profitable items. The low profit items, for whatever reason, are the biggest sellers that are taking sales away from the higher profit items. And of course, labor is working just as hard. You're paying your staff just as much to provide prepare those low profit items as the high. So even if you're, you know, filling your seats and you got a busy restaurant, you're scratching your head, you're wondering why your bank account just isn't growing, chances are it's because of your menu. It is the biggest thing that contributes to the bottom line. So it's either designed for profit or not. If this idea intrigues you, why not reach out to me, Roger, R-O-G-E-R -E at restaurantrockstars.com. I love to talk shop with operators. Email me. We'll set up a free, you know, 30-minute consultation. I love talking shop. Like I said, love to talk to you about your particular pain points and challenges in your restaurant. So if I can help, I'm here. Thanks. And we're so happy that you tune in every single week. So why not recommend us to other owners that you know or GMs and give us a review on iTunes. It'll help those other operators find us because we're all about adding back to the industry and helping other operators run a stronger, more profitable operation. Thanks again for tuning in. We'll see you in the next episode. Thanks for listening to, to the, the Restaurant, Restaurant Rockstars, Rockstars Podcast. Podcast.
for lots of great resources. Head over to restaurantrockstars.com. See you next time.